go ahead and get started. Um, at the end of last class, I was trying to rush through this reading of the new system of nature. <coughs> and we are just kind of getting some of the basics of what Leibniz philosophy, philosophy includes. We already went over this, but I thought it'd be kind of good to start with this question to reorient us into thinking about Leibniz. Um, Leibniz does not believe that there are at least what we would call material atoms. Does anybody remember one of the reasons that he gives for rejecting the existence of material atoms? Yeah. That they can't be divided, so they don't Yeah, or more precisely, that's, a, that's right, that since matter can always be divided, like it has some kind of extension to it, then the most fundamental kind of thing must have no extension and therefore not be material. Um, so if atoms can be... So material things can always be divided in some way. Uh, no matter how big it is, you can always say, what's half of that, right? So Leibniz said, whatever is the most fundamental constituent of the universe, the most basic kind of thing that exists that has no, base, no simpler parts, would have to have no extension to it. It would have to be immaterial. And so that's what he calls in the system of nature these atoms of substance or metaphysical points. Um, and as you read for this week, these, the, the name he ultimately gives these things is uh, monads. We'll talk about that. But speaking of which, if you have homework to turn in, pull that out and pass it to the middle. I'll pick those up in, uh, in a second. Um, so, the first thing to kind of realize for Leibniz's philosophy is that he rejects the existence of atoms or material things as being a basic part of the universe. So, so, um, Leibniz is often referred to as an idealist, which doesn't mean like, you know, a dreamer or somebody who wants world peace or something, but an idealist in the sense that the most basic part of reality is not matter, but thought or immateriality. We're going to read about another idealist later in this course named Barclay. Um, but for now, um, let's think about Leibniz as an idealist. Um, so one of the things he believes is that the universe doesn't have these material atoms to it. He thinks that the universe is made up of immaterial atoms. Um, we talked about how everything, the, the complete concept or the complete notion of, of, of a concept would be one that contains its past, its present, and its future. And so um, he thinks that the, you are one of these substances, one of these um, atoms of substance, and so you contain within yourself your complete history, that what you are as you is not just what you are right now, it's what you were and what you will be. And if you change any of those things, it's no longer you we're talking about. We're talking about something else altogether. Um... So in the class, I did not read this, but I kind of went over it real quick at the end. Let's go ahead and read this. Um, if you have your book, open it up to page 273. I'm going to look at the right-hand column. Or, sorry, the left column. So... Um, so he says, this is that top paragraph on the left. He says, I must admit that they have penetrated the difficulty by articulating what could not possibly be the case. But their explanation of what actually happens does not appear to eliminate the difficulty. The they there is this group of people called occasionalists. We talked about the occasionalists real briefly. What is it? Anybody remember what do occasionalists think about causation? Yeah. 
We didn't read about it, and I kind of filled it in when we were at the very end of our discussion of Elizabeth's correspondence. Yeah. I, only, I, th- I think I'm wrong, but is it those people that believe that God makes all our actions for us? That's pretty much it. Right. That God alone is the only cause in the universe. So they, the occasionalists thought, when dealing with this problem, how do mind and body interact, is they said, well, they don't literally interact with one another. What happens is when your mind says, arm go up, God jumps in and causes your arm to go up. And when you stub your toe on a rock, it's not that the nerves in your brain cause you to feel pain, because brain and mind cannot interact. It's that God jumps in there and every single time causes your mind to have the sensation of pain. So the occasionalist fix the mind-body problem, so to speak, by having God perform a miracle every single time mind and body interact. So this is what he's talking about here. He said, those guys, um, they penetrated the difficulty by articulating what could not possibly be the case. And their explanation of what actually happens does not appear to eliminate the problem. Okay. It is quite true that speaking with metaphysical rigor, there's no real influence of one created substance on another, and that all things, with all their reality, are continually produced by the power of God. But in solving problems, it is not (coughs) sufficient to make use of the general cause and to invoke what is called a deus ex machina, For when one does that without giving any other explanation derived from the order of secondary causes, it is, properly speaking, having recourse to a miracle. In philosophy, we must try to give reasons by showing how things are brought about by divine wisdom, but in conformity with the notion of the subject in question. So he's criticizing these occasionalists because they're trying to fix this problem by basically having God step in every time and do a miracle. Well, miracles are nice if you need to have a miracle every now and then to explain the universe. But if you need to have a miracle take place pretty much constantly in the universe to explain it, then you really don't have a good theory here. Why are they called occasionalists if it happens all the time? Well, they, they saw it as what we do, we don't cause things, we create occasions for God to cause things. So it's, it's think of occasion more like a prompting, not as in sense of like occasionally, but in the sense of like this is the occasion in which God jumps in and does that. Uh, that's why I was confused about it. Yeah. I didn't make the name. Once you name something in philosophy, it's over. You know, so somebody else named it, and now we're stuck with it. It's like whoever named, well, these are philosophy jokes that only I would get. Okay. <laughs> now, let's keep reading in the next paragraph, and look for this phrase um, where he says, our internal sensations are are true appearances and like well-ordered dreams. And I want to talk about this. This is related to the next issue, which is about how is it that if everything's immaterial, the most basic things are immaterial, what are desks and chairs and tables and everything else? So he says, therefore, since I was forced to agree that it is not possible for the soul or any other true substance to receive something from without, except by divine omnipotence, I was led little by little to a view that surprised me, but which seems inevitable, and which in fact has very great advantages and rather considerable beauty. That is, we must say that God originally created the soul and any other real entity in such a way that everything must arise for it from its own death through a perfect spontaneity relative to itself, and yet with a perfect conformity relative to to external things. And thus, since our internal sensations, meaning those in the soul itself and not those in the brain or in any other subtle parts of the body, are merely phenomena which follow upon external beings, or better, they are true appearances and like well-ordered dreams, those internal perceptions in the soul itself must arise because of its own original constitution. That is, they must arise through the representative nature capable of expressing external things as they relate to its organs given to the soul from its creation, which constitutes its, its individual character. So this is kind of... Let me, we'll get to this part of the quote in a moment. What he's saying here is that every substance that we've been talking about, every simple organism, every simple thing, 
the complete concept of it contains its past, its present, its future. And what happens then with mind and body is not that the two interact with one another. It's not that he doesn't he doesn't think there is a way to explain how mind can interact with body and vice versa. But what he does say could be done, and he doesn't and I should say one other thing, he doesn't think that God is going to perform a miracle every time we need that interaction. That's just too sloppy and inelegant. God would do better than that. So how do we fix the problem? We set it so that mind and body don't causally interact with one another, but they are perfectly timed in synchronization, such that they don't interact, but they behave just like they do. So God has created your mind such that it has events go on in it that are perfectly synced up with what happens in the body. And likewise, because of the way he's committed to understanding these simple substances, they don't causally interact with one another. So how is it that you're able to experience the world? If, like, if, how do you experience a chair if a chair can't causally interact with your eyes? Well, he says it's the same kind of thing, that your soul or your mind is so perfectly set up by God such that when your body moves to where you should see a chair, it is time such that you experience, ding, a chair right then. Um, I may have used this last time where if you're having a conversation with somebody, it's not that you can causally interact with them, like with the sound waves of their voice, or um, you know they, they can't hear your voice, that you don't actually interact with one another. What is it? You're perfectly timed, such that your soul release, sort of unlocks, as time progresses, that experience of perceiving voices when you should hear them. And then the other person, at just the right time, he, you know, perceives your voice. But not because of they actually interact with one another, it's contained within yourself. So, when you experience the world, and you see tables and chairs and everything else, he says that is like those internal sensations are true appearances and like well-ordered dreams. Why does he say that? What would be maybe a badly ordered dream? Like what happens in a confusing and, and bizarre dream? Yeah. Unrelated events? Yeah, I mean, crazy stuff happens, right? Uh, you know, you are one minute in a classroom, you turn around, and the next minute you're outside, and then a dragon is chasing you, and then you've got a, a little puppy dog or something, right? Things just don't make any sense. But in a well-ordered dream, things fit together in a coherent way. Our experience of the world, he says, is not really of the world. It's just our own internal experience. So in a way, it's like but not exactly like. Our entire lives are dreams. That God has pre-established before you ever came into existence your nature such that when you come into existence you would have this synchronization, this synchronized experience of the world. But since you don't actually interact with the world, all it is is just like a well-ordered dream. It comes from within yourself. It doesn't come from the outside. Now, he says these are true appearances, so he's not a skeptic, he's not trying to say, don't believe there is a world. He's saying that these appearances, while they come from the inside, they're not generated from the outside world, it still is the case that um, there's a truth about them, that, that God has thankfully arranged things such that we sh what happens does tell us about the way things are. Um, we're going to have a lot more to say about this idea um, with the rest of his philosophy. Um, so, representational content, visual, auditory, tactile, taste, olfactory, all those kinds of experiences we have, they're not caused by external things, but they are generated from the internal constitution of the being that has it. By that I mean by it's generated by your own self. All this stuff is inside of you, and just it becomes sort of unlocked, it unfolds just with time. 
So all of your experiences and all the things that you have in your mind are sort of pre-timed events. God creates every single individual containing within itself its own representation of the entire universe. Now he says it's it is, he, he emphasizes this is a, an entire representation of the universe, but just from your perspective. But in this way, everything in the universe is interconnected on his view. You can't, you can't think on Leibniz's view, what would, what would I be like if, um, you know, if I was five feet taller? Leibniz says that wouldn't be you anymore. Because if you change that, you'd have to change everything else in the universe. Because that, the way, if you were five feet taller, then that would change what everybody else thought about you. It would change the clothes that you bought. And if those clothes were bought, then somebody else couldn't buy them. And so you'd have to change that about them. And if maybe somebody, if they didn't buy that piece of clothing, they wouldn't meet their spouse. And if that, you know, you'd change everything in the universe. And as a result, we're not even talking about the same universe anymore. So Leibniz says you are essentially everything you do. And you change one little thing about you, and it's a different you altogether. It's a different world. We're not even in, we can't even fathom what that would be like. Yeah. What about people who like lose a lot of weight? Are they totally different then? For Leibniz, he would say that was part of their nature to lose the weight. So it was, change is possible, but all the change has to come from within. So as, the way that, that things work like that is that, that essentially what was part of that person's essence was that they would eventually come on to, to lose that weight. Yeah? Is there like, is there any way to break that mold? Or is it just all like, if you made a drastic life change? Like, he know, would say no. That's already like, previously. that's part of who you are as well. So we're gonna. I mean, one of the concerns that comes up with this is free will <coughs> and you know destiny and some of these kinds of, of interesting concepts. Leibniz doesn't think he has this problem, but certainly a lot of people are very concerned about that. So if nothing interacts with one another, if, there, if everything is generated just from within oneself, I mean, how does this work practically speaking? Well. God created each and every substance such that everything is in perfect agreement with one another. It's sort of like if you had a bunch of wind-up toys that like, you know, move and dance around. If you could set those toys up such that they all look like they would like participate in some team sport, they don't actually participate together. It's just all from their own internal workings that it looks like they have like some cooperative thing going on. You know, if you could get a bunch of wind-up toys that look like they're like dancing together, like doing like uh, you know some kind of uh, square dance or something like that, that would be really cool looking. But it would be it wouldn't be right to say that the the toys interact with one another or respond to one another. It's just from within their own nature that they're able to have this configuration that looks like a dance. In the same way, God has set up every single monad, every one of these immaterial substances in the universe such that they all have their own internal nature and as time unfolds they're able to create this nice harmonious universe. Something that would never happen on its own but with God's providence of course you could arrange that. So basically like two countries at war with one another, Leibniz would say the one country was meant to go to war with the other country to kill those people that was part of their internal nature to die at this point in time. That's right. Everything, yeah. But then that's not really a harmonious agreement because we don't argue anymore. So. Hold on to that from the monadology because <laughs> he's going to argue to everyone's amazement that this world is the best of all possible worlds and that God should create this world for that reason. <coughs> yeah. So, and back, back to the toy example, we're all kind of like, in his view, we're all kind of like robot toys that can perceive us dancing. That's right. All right. That's right. We're all these. You. You. Where, yeah, I mean, like, your nature contains within it everything that makes you do all the things that you do, perceive the things you perceive, and the universe is just all of these parts put together in a way that there's this harmony and balance and unity. Um, 
Let's get to this, because this is the ultimate question. We start going here. Everyone starts thinking about, what, what about my free will? Um, look at the first full paragraph here on 274. So when he's talking about this view, he calls this view um, pre the pre-established harmony of the universe. So he's talking about pre-established harmony. He says, it also has this great advantage. That instead of saying that we are free only in appearance and in a way that in a way sufficient for practical purposes, as several intelligent persons have believed, we should rather say we are determined only in appearance, and that in rigorously metaphysical language we have perfect independence relative to the influence of every other creature. This also shows throws a marvelous light on immortality of our soul and the always uniform conservation of our individual being, which is perfectly well regulated by its own nature and protected from all external accidents. Um, let me stop there. He thinks that this model gives you more freedom than any other model. Why? Because in, on his view, nothing can stop you from doing what you want to do that there is no outside force that can prevent you, besides God, but God doesn't do that here, um, but there's nothing that could stop you from following your nature. So, because there's no outside cause that is keeping you, or stopping you, or causing you to do what you do, everything you do comes from your own nature, comes from within, you're okay. Um, so, he thinks that we are determined um, we are determined only in appearance, which is the sense in which you say, but wait, I couldn't act any differently than I do. But he says, that's really not an important aspect of our freedom. You really don't, this is my own way of reading it now, you don't want to have the ability to do anything else than what you do. If you see a child drowning in like a shallow pool of mud, and you can save that child's life, you go and save the child's life, and you really don't value the thought that, man, I really wish I could do something different here. You, you actually want, I think, to be such that there's, when you see that, it better be the only thing you choose to do. So, think about, the way he's th wanting me to think about this is, you are free to do what you are supposed to be. You are free to fulfill your nature, to let your essence of who you are unfold in an unfettered and undisturbed uh, way. No outside force can stop that. And that is what makes you free. So, no su other substance, nothing on the outside can causally affect any other substance. So each individual is free insofar as it is able to act according to its internal essence perfectly without any outside influences. And that's the sense in which he says we're free. And more free than anyone else says, because on all the other philosophies out there, you can have one substance causing another substance, which means one thing can stop you from, doing, from being free. Whereas on his view, nothing stops you. It's all... All the, all the things that happen to you are caused by yourself. So, what do y'all think about this? Do you think that this is... Does this sound a little more plausible as an account of free will, or do you, do you still have some reservations? Yeah, Sarah? Well, it's saying, he says that God is creating... Create, God creates us to do, like, everything that he wants, but, like, we're supposedly fulfilling our nature, so whatever he chooses our nature to be, that's what we have to do, but kind of not like free will. <laughs> it's not free because you want to choose your own nature? Yeah. Similar concern comes up from uh, Lady Masham. We'll talk about that, too. Anybody think this makes, makes this a little easier to swallow, or is it still unpalatable for most of you? Uh, Alex? I think it's interesting, but I, I don't think it's free will. <laughs> I think it's kind of like acceptance of like determinism almost, but I don't know why he's insisting it's free will. Other thoughts? That's good. 
Well, we're not done with this. I mean, like I said with Leibniz, we're going to kind of keep getting his philosophy. Yeah. Um, he says like you're free to fulfill your nature, but you have no other choice because you can't break the mold. So th there's conflict, two intuitions about free will that we want to resolve. One is, some of us have the idea to be free, you have to be able to act in other ways. Leibniz rejects that. To be free, he says, does not require that. But here's another sense in which we think freedom matters. Freedom matters insofar as you're free when you're able to do what you want to do, when you're able to follow what, you, uh, what your nature and your character dictate you should do. He says you can do that. Yeah. So wait, is what I'm, whatever I'm doing, is that already predetermined? Yeah. Okay. So stop, he's going to say, stop trying to act, you're not going to be able to act otherwise, but you're, you are able to act in accordance with your nature. Yeah. I feel like the nature comes after, like after your actions or thoughts. Think of nature not as like personality, which is, or your, your, your character, Think of it more as like what you are as a thing. Like there's a nature to this desk. You know, the desk has a certain nature that you could argue was true of the desk before it existed. It's like the the essence, the thought of what the desk is. Likewise to you, there is an essence to what you are as, you know, Vincent. There is a Vincent nature that makes you unique from everything else in the universe. And that would include all the choices you make. If you made different choices, you wouldn't be Vincent. Therefore, you are, that's part of his case for kind of saying you can't act otherwise, otherwise you wouldn't be you. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah? So it seems he has like an entirely different definition of free will. Yeah. This so works more like, if you've had me for intro, which I know you have. There are two ways to define free will. One is the libertarian view, which says free will means being able to act in alternative ways. There's another view called compatibilism, which says free will is consistent with being causally determined. He is a compatibilist. Contrary to what our little secondary source says by Kenny, he, I, this is one part of his book that I thought was flat out wrong. He calls Leibniz a libertarian, and I see no possible way that could be true. If you're interested in this, this would be one subject you could tackle in a paper. Leibniz on free will, there's a ton of things on it. So we're going to move on to the big book, the Monadology. This is actually, we have a piece of, this is handwritten stuff from it. It's pretty cool. Um, and this is about, it's not quite 20 years, but it's close to 20 years after the last the reading that we just went over. And this is usually thought of at least of the writings we have of him, the most systematic, the most complete explanation of his philosophical system, although it still is incomplete in a lot of ways. Let's go ahead and take a look at these first six sections. So it starts on page 275, and, I'm, and I've now marked everything off with just the section numbers for the monadology because it's nicely organized this way. Um, and as we read this, I'm going to ask you, which is essentially the first question on your homework, which is, what is, he, what is a monad? So let's talk about monads. He says, the monad, which we shall discuss here, is nothing but a simple substance that enters into composites. Simple, that is, without parts. And there must be simple substances, since there are composites, for the composite is nothing other than a com collection or aggregate of simples. And where there are no parts, neither extension nor shape nor divisibility is possible. These monads are the true atoms of nature and, in brief, the elements of things. There is also no dissolution to fear, and there is no conceivable way in which a simple substance can perish naturally. For the same reason, there is no conceivable way a simple substance can begin naturally, since it cannot be formed by composition. Thus, one can say that monads can only begin or end all at once. That is, they can only begin by creation and end by annihilation, whereas composite, composites begin or end through their parts. So, what are some of the things that we see about monads here? <coughs> hmm? they're, like the, they're the basis of all things. <coughs> they're the most basic things, and what is that? So, what, how does he define that? That's right. Mm-hmm. 
So they can't have extension. Why? Because if they had extension, once again, you could break them up into parts. So if they're most basic, they have no parts. I was just going to um, say that they were like the true atom, like the, that he, did, he defines them as like the true atom. That's right. So they're not material atoms. They're, <laughs> they're just like what we just read in the new system where he's saying that these are, you know, maybe formal atoms or immaterial atoms. So these monads are the most basic things in the universe. They don't have extension, so they don't have shape or, or figure. They can't be divided up in any way. What else do we know about them? Does he tell us about them? Yeah. They can't begin or end naturally? They can't begin or end naturally. And this is because they are simple things. <laughs> so a composite can come into existence and go out of existence by being put together. I mean, to take like a sand castle. A sand castle is made out of sand. The sand castle can come into existence by putting the parts in the right shape and go out of existence by kicking it over and removing all that structure. Um, but you and I, we cannot create sand. The sand is already there. Of course, we could always, I mean, because sand is actually, you know, the kind of thing we could break down atomically, it's not simple. But he's going to say if, if these monads are indivisible, they don't have any parts, you couldn't take them out of existence by, like, ripping them apart. In the same way, you can't bring them into existence by putting stuff together. They just have to be there. This is very similar, by the <coughs> way, to an argument that Socrates gives um, for the existence of the soul and immortality of the soul. Socrates says the soul is a, is a simple thing. It has no parts. So when you die, it can't be dissolved. Therefore, when you die, your soul continues to live on. So simple sub substance, monads are simple substances that have no parts. Simple, they are symbols that must exist because there are composite things. Um, since there are composite objects, we're led to wonder what are its parts. And the most simplest kind of one would have to be one that has no extension, shape, or divisibility. And since they have no composite parts, they cannot come naturally come into existence or go out of existence. Um, only God is capable of creating monads and destroying monads. One of the questions, I think the very next question I had is, what about the nature of change in monad? Um, how is it that monads are capable of ch changing or not? Uh, let's go ahead and look at section 7. He says, there is also no way of explaining how a monad can be altered or changed internally by some other creature. Since one cannot transpose anything in it, nor can one conceive of any internal motion that can be excited, directed, augmented, or diminished within it, as can be done with composites, where there can be change among parts. The monads have no windows through which something can enter or leave. <coughs> Accidents cannot be detached, nor can they go about outside of substances as the sensible species of the scholastics once did. Thus, neither substance nor accident can enter a monad from without. So what is, what is he saying here about monads? He's, one of the weird things is monads have no windows. What's that? Mm -hmm. I think they have no parts or no like, spaces that could be changed within it. It's just one single like, solid object. Yeah, so it's like one simple single unity. That can be combined with others, but that's it. And then you can't change itself. Yeah, so it, since it has no parts within it, it's not like you could move the parts within it around, so it can't exchange things with other monads. Um, it, can't, it can't receive anything into it, and it can't send anything out of it. So when this comes to change, what does this mean? It's impossible for there to be any change from the outside. Now, does that mean it's impossible for there to be change in the monad period? In sections 10 and 11, 
he takes us into this other idea. So let's take a look. 10 and 11 are really short. Let's go ahead and read those. It says, I also take for granted that every created th being, and consequently the created monad as well, is subject to change. And even this change is continual in each thing. Well, we just said, how do you change? Nothing can go in or out of it. So how does it change? Section 11. It follows from what we've just said that the monad's natural changes come from an internal principle, since no external cause can influence it internally. So, these simple things are not capable of causally, causally influencing one another. Um, yet, they obviously do undergo change. Like, just look at your own life and your own experience. You are experiencing change all the time. So how is that possible? Not by any influence from the outside, but it comes from some internal principle. And this is related to what we've already been talking about, that you contain within yourself all of your own essence, everything about you, past, present, future. So that means that as time goes on, you experience change not because things from the outside change you, but because things from the inside move you. It's your own nature. It's your own essence. It's your own being to be this way, to have these experiences. So you change because of these internal principles from within you. It's from your own self that you undergo change. So far, so good. So... How is it that we then perceive the world? Uh, there's no windows inside the world. Uh, uh, there's no windows in or out. Um, how is this possible? Well, he says, first of all, he says that monad, every monad, has perception to it. Um, so every single monad, including, so there are monads like you and I, that are rational creatures, but even monads have to make up my water bottle and have to make up this clicker and have to make up the table. Is he seriously saying that all of these things have perceptions? Yes. But he does want to say that perception is different from apperception. Uh, apperception is the idea of self-awareness, like self-consciousness. So that there's a sense in which all these other things have a kind of perception, like the monads that would make up the desk or your book or this clicker. They have perceptions insofar as we're going to see later, too, that they are driven by what he calls appetite, or he calls them an entelechy. And what that means is that it's this internal principle idea that from within them, they're moved. They desire, almost, to, to go places and do things and follow their nature. Perception, or so apperception is different in that it's a, a kind of self-awareness that we have, um, that rational creatures have, but not all monads have that. Um, in section 17, he gives us an interesting example about touring a mill. And this is supposed to be related to thinking about consciousness. This is kind of related to something I wrote my doctoral dissertation on. Let's take a a look at this passage. He says, we must confess that the perception and what depends on it is inexplicable in terms of mechanical reasons, that is, through shapes and motions. If we imagine that there is a machine <coughs> whose structure makes it think, sense, and have perceptions, we could conceive it in large, keeping the same proportions, so that we could enter into it as one enters into a mill. According, assuming that, inspecting its interior, we will only find parts that push one another, and we will never find anything to explain a perception. And so, we should seek perception in the simple substance and not in the composite or in the machine. So, what is he saying about perception? You think of perception as like consciousness. Why does he say that you couldn't find consciousness in a machine? I want you to think 
some of you might be inclined to think your consciousness is just something that is caused by the brain. <coughs> yeah. Well, isn't this, couldn't it be as simple as just saying a machine couldn't possibly think or make conscious de decisions? It's just programmed to do a certain thing and it just does that certain task? It's not what he's getting at. You could make that case, but that's not the case he's making. Yeah. Are you saying that there's no specific thing you could point to that would lead to a consciousness? What you would find is all the events that go on in the machine. You never find the consciousness. Where is the consciousness? Suppose you think consciousness is nothing more than brain activity. Some of you might be inclined to that view. Well, Leibniz says, imagine we could just enlarge your brain by like a hundred times. And then we could like tour your brain. We could give like walking tours. You know, this is, you know, this is Jane's brain. Um, you know, here's the hippocampus, and so on. If Jane was thinking of, a, a, I don't know, a pink hippopotamus, you could tour her brain, you could see all the parts, you could see the chemical reactions, you could see the, the synapses, you could see the neural networks, you could tour the whole brain and get a complete examination of it, would you ever find a pink elephant in there? No. You would just find a bunch of events that are different from being a pink elephant. Well, what Leibniz is saying, I think, is something very similar to that, which is you can never get consciousness out of mechanic, out of like mechanistic events. One thing pushing another, one thing transferring energy to another, one thing, you know, uh, um, one thing having some sort of chemical reaction. All that would just be one thing happening to another thing, but where's the consciousness? The consciousness, no matter how many of those things you have put together, you're never going to get a consciousness out of it. So consciousness, he says, you'll never find it in those kinds of things. It's got to be something actually more basic, something simpler than the events themselves. It's almost backwards, he thinks, to be trying to find consciousness in these larger causings, these larger mechanistic events. It's actually, you have to explain the mechanistic events in his view in terms of consciousness. I think that's kind of neat. Um, so, the next few things relate to what I was just talking about with appetites and what he calls intelligence. What he calls appetites is like this internal driving force, the, these things that move us to do the things we do. Now for like you and I, as rational creatures, sometimes I mean we experience these as like literal appetites, like we get hungry so we go get food. Um, you get thirsty, get a drink of water, um, and so on. But in simpler organisms, it's like saying of these, all these monads, they're being driven by their own internal desires, their own internal nature, to do all the things that they do. Um, so he calls these entelechies, this is a word from Aristotle's metaphysics, um, which is sort of like an inborn end purpose. They're like purpose-driven beings. So they're driven not from the outside by external causes, but they're driven from within, that they just do what they do by their own nature. So he says that we can, if you like, we can call these things souls, these monads, because they have perceptions and appetites, which he thinks is sort of sufficient for something being a soul. But at the same time, they're not souls entirely like you and I. Just remember they don't have self-awareness, that they aren't rational creatures like you and I are. Uh, there are questions about this so far. Yeah. Yeah. Um, basically, if you move something, right? Like I'm, if I'm moving mm -hmm. a banana. Doesn't that mean I am like, well, at least my body is moving the monads. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the and he's saying that the monads in the banana wanted to do that. Yeah. Imagine. 
it, what if the this was a perfectly timed event by God, such that when you think you're picking up the banana, those monads are actually voluntarily moving with you. So that you're not actually moving them as you think you are, they are moving themselves in just that perfect harmonious action to give the appearance of, mo of being moved. But I, I, I'm, I'm just done talking about my hand. Mainly right. Not, not me thinking about just the action yeah. of my hand moving. So my hand and the banana yeah. both want to do that. That's right. That's I mean, that's one way to think about that. That everything in the universe is, is like that. It's driven within its own self to move in these ways. Okay. Yeah. Like what would the energy force be within the monad if it has no parts? He wants to say that that's just part of what it means to be a monad, is to be a self-driven thing. There's this idea, we're going to see this come up in Locke later, that spirits are like active things, and matter is passive. So that like souls or minds are capable of like energetic a action, and matter is not. It needs to be moved. Well, he's gonna, so he's kind of building on this same idea, saying that, well, monads as being like these basic souls are just sort of like pure activity in a way. I think that you might have been kind of just saying this just now, but I'm trying to just get a hold on it. Sure. Um, a monad wouldn't necessarily need any kind of energy source to move or anything like that because it's, like you said, he's an occasionalist, so everything has been predetermined by God, so it just goes. It's not really like something's driving it or anything like that. It just kind of happens because that's the way it's been determined to happen. That's right. The only small edit is I would not call him an occasionalist. Right. Or, but but he, everything else you said is great. That okay. It's almost like everything contains within itself its own energy source. Right. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a quick break here. Um, I apologize by sounding like I'm repeating myself, but I think sometimes... The best way with Leibniz is just to say it in as many different ways as I can because it is kind of weird. And eventually something might sit. So let's, let's take uh, one of our quick breaks here from, let's try to be back when this clock says uh, 6.32. <coughs>